Good morning, Mark. Looks like once again we are live in the interwebs. Live in the realm. We are. We are live. How are you today, mate? I'm well. You're well? You well. rugged up? I'm sorry? <laughs> you rugged up? Yeah, I am. It's a little cool here. They had snow on the mountains on uh, Saturday, which is this late in the year is very rare for us. Snow in general around us is very rare. But, you know, it's a new world that we lived in. Nothing is normal anymore. Which kind of what our subject is today. Nothing is normal. No, no, nothing is normal anymore. And um, it's funny just hearing you talking about the freezing cold. I actually haven't felt the cold like that for a long time. Um, heat is the normal. But as I say that, it's a rainy, stormy day outside. Just um, getting sorted here. All right. Um, so... We're going to talk about becoming irrelevant. What happens when you do become irrelevant and what do you do to recover? It's a, it's a funny one. Um, I went through an experience in early 2017 when I launched my book, actually, um, just, up, just after I launched my book, um, where fa the Facebook algorithm changed and I literally, I remember seeing a graph, checking a graph, and I was trending high, and it literally went to zero. Mm -hmm. And it was like from thousands of views a day to literally one or two. And that's a funny experience to become irrelevant overnight. And you know, that's out of our control. Mostly, most of the time, it's in our control. Um, most of the time, becoming irrelevant happens when we lag behind in our learning or lag behind in the work we do, that sort of thing. Mostly it's in our control, but um, it can happen to us. And it's not, it's not fun. I remember thinking, wow, what do I do now? You know, without the normal reach that I had, and I'd spent eight years simply posting to Facebook to gather clients and doing it very easily. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought the world had kind of stopped. <laughs> I realized that it hadn't a few weeks later, um, all was well, but it was a very interesting time. Um, do you have an experience of becoming irrelevant, Mark, that you want to oh, share const with? Constantly. Mm. Um, and that's probably, and more, that's probably more the point, more the point. Yeah, there, there are so many ways to become irrelevant, some within our control and some outside of our control. So we have to look at the problem, I think, from multiple directions. I think the easiest way to become irrelevant is to be out of touch with your market and your, your peers. Even though you may be writing a book, even though you may doing, be doing cutting edge work, if you're not there and people can't see what you're working on and talk with you and interact with you, then you are distancing yourself from what everybody else is doing. You're progressing and they are not. So it's very easy to become irrelevant even though you have improved the situation. And this is, I think, one of the things entrepreneurs have a very difficult time with is they build a better mousetrap, but in the process of building it, they've gone too far and they've lost the market. The market can't relate to what they're doing. They can't understand the iterations and the improvement cycles that you've done. It's kind of like when I was in high school, I, I ran distance, cross country kinds of races. And I was not a particularly good race runner. Uh, but one of the things that I noticed was that if you were on a long course, which is a, like, a lot like our long life, right? And if you're out in front and there's nobody on your heels and you're in that groove, you're in that flow, that state of flow, which I, we've all been in that flow where things are just totally focused on what we're doing. And we miss the markers on the trail. 
or the course. And then we look up and go, where's everybody go? Where'd all the people go? And you realize you're off course. And by the time you turn around and get back to where you were, the race has gone by and they're way ahead of you. Yeah. And now it's like, oh my gosh, I was so far ahead. There was nobody even close. And I put myself out of the race because I got too far ahead. Yeah. And I've done that multiple times in my career. Um, and it's a very frustrating scenario. Um, it, it's frustrating because people don't appreciate you. And the reaction is, first thing they'll do is they'll ridicule you because you're so different from everybody else. And then if you don't give up and buckle to the social pressure, then you just become the crackpot crazy man until the market catches up and then you become a profit genius because you were so far ahead and nobody else could recognize it. It's, so it's, it's funny how that cycle works. Yeah. And it is, it does happen like that. Um, it's very interesting when, yeah, to be in that position, I've been in that position before where like you, you're too far and people start to think you're a crackpot and you actually start to believe in yourself you're becoming a crackpot because you're like you're wondering who's right who's wrong you know that you're right because you know i think that we always intuitively know that we're on the right directions and that's why we push forward um the perfect example is when um years ago when we we're in the sports industry and had a, a surfboard and we were years ahead of our time and yeah. now only now like this was mid 90s we created this board only now are we seeing the tricks available for that. People thought we were completely Not, mad. Yeah. Completely, completely mad. Um, but now, if, if, we, if it came out now, I mean, there actually is boards like that now. Um, you know, back then we were crackpots. You know, today we'd be not the norm. Yeah, it's... I, and I think this is, this is one of the reasons why musicians and artists end up dying poppers because the market the the audience is they can't keep up with them yeah yeah i think uh, it's probably a lot of the reason why um some of those musos and that sort of thing you know actually end up dead through overdose and that sort of thing because they are being ostracized so so heavily um you know they may well be be famous but they're they're still not understood and I think being understood is a big, you know, something that we all kind of need to have um, in some way, shape or form. But nope. bringing this back to the, you know, the average business owner, um, if they have become relevant, if they do have ideas that are a little bit out there, or if they've gone in a direction that their market may not be used to, and they're kind of stuck out on that limb. Um, what are the easiest ways for them to, and well, what are the easiest ways for them to reconnect without that sounding too obvious? Yeah. I think that there's a process to this. And, you know, I, I read a lot. I am constantly looking for other perceptions and other views and other ideas of which I liberally do R and D uh, you know, what R and D is right. Mm, sure. Rip off and duplicate. <laughs> Not your version, but okay. <laughs> I, the first time I heard that I would thought, Oh, this is just perfect. This is for the unimaginative wait for somebody to come with a better deal and then rip them off and, and copy it. Um, but you know, no, that that's the that's the whole process of collaboration. This is one of the reasons why you want to be diverse in your study and in your observation of life, uh, because what is normal and established in one area, one business, is completely new and never been touched in another area. So it's very easy to see what's working in another industry and then adapt it for your particular area. Um, and so usually the process that I have experienced that works extremely well for me has been to, uh, look at other business models. And I'm always, I'm reading all kinds of books on business models, business design. I've shared some of them with you. Um, 
there's hundreds of different business models out there. Mm, sure. I think five or 600 at least. Um, and so looking at, at what they're, what they do, one of my favorite games to play is adopt the business model. How do we take a distribution model and apply it to a manufacturing business? And where the advantages lie, where does it slow things down? What can we do to improve the cycle? And what it teaches you is how to deconstruct your business into its various component elements. Um, part of business complexity is just building on unstable, unproven, inefficient systems until you've got a house of cards that comes collapsing down when the first breeze blows through or if somebody knocks a card out on one of the levels, the whole thing collapses. Um, COVID certainly exposed that in millions of businesses. Yeah, uh, it, it, it was it, um, <clears throat> something that made a lot of businesses irrelevant almost overnight. Exactly, and that was one of the reasons why I thought about this is that the world is beginning to wake up now and um, it's, it's kind of crazy. It's really, you know, here in the States, it's still very strange. You've got, you know, the, the head of this CDC thing, this Fauci guy, you know, he's telling us now that we've got the shots and the vaccines, we still have to wear our masks and we still have to social distance. And it's like, uh, I, heard some, I heard somewhere the other day that they're telling you to wear two masks. Yes, exactly. If one doesn't work, you may as well wear two. <laughs> right. So two, does two work? Does two not work twice as bad? <laughs> twice as badly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, it's just this kind of moving the goalposts, you know. And, moving and that's the that's the perfect um, <laughs> expression of complexity. <laughs> exactly. But it, it's you know this business of you know of of making things complex and piling things on top of other things um, it, until it just doesn't work. And then everything collapses and everything drops. Now there's super, there are super opportunities when that kind of a thing happens. And for me, for COVID, coming out of COVID has been incredible. Yeah, I cannot can't tell you how much business there is. Yeah, you've been absolutely crushing it, which is great to hear. And well, I had another 12K over the weekend yeah. for, for a three month and you know little three month um, assist it wasn't even really heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the thing about it is, is that coming out of it now, out of this unstable system, the playing field has been completely leveled. The game that everybody was playing before the virus is over. And they're now coming back into the stadium to play a new game. And it's been configured for a new sport. It It's not, football or rugby anymore it's basketball or it's not basketball it's baseball or yeah. soccer or whatever and so all of a sudden nobody knows where they fit in or how they how relevant they are in their position where their strategy is relevant you know where's our advantage where's the disadvantage you know what's the game plan what's the playbook and the answer is there are none everybody's been in such a reactionary hunkered down uh, defensive mode for a year that now that they're coming out of it, two things are happening. And the first thing is, is that they're still extremely tentative and scared. They're scaredy cat and they're in scaredy cat mode. Yeah. Uh, and then the second thing is, is that they are realizing that the game has changed and they're not sure whether they can get back into it or not. They don't even know whether the game is still in play. It's interesting that you mentioned those two points because at the start of this, I remember talking with all of my clients saying, now is the time to pounce. Like when everyone goes into that scaredy cat mode, now is the time to get ahead of the pack. And yeah, you know, they all did extremely well through COVID and they're all still thriving. But it's, it's funny how um, a lot of people did sit back and sitting in, in sitting back, you become irrelevant. Right, yeah, you did Like people perceive that COVID was making them irrelevant or, you know, making them pivot and making them have to change business. You know, COVID was just the warning flag of now's the time to get up and run. Um, whereas a lot of people took it as we've got to stop completely and reassess the game in a year's time. 
And that's what people are still reassessing versus actually stepping forward. I, I think the bigger, the big picture out of this, James, is that COVID is just one example of any type of unexpected disruption. Yep. It could be a fire, it could be a hurricane, it could be a typhoon, it could be an earthquake, it could be a pandemic, it could be, it could be a death in the family, it could be a, it could be a, a it could be anything. It could be, a, it could be a meteor from space, you know? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> the aliens. The, the aliens, exactly. That'll, That'll be the next batch. Yeah. So it's just an excuse. And and this is something that, you know, I've been preparing for and and, you know, for 10 years now. It's been almost 10 years. 2012 will be 10 years uh, or 2022 will be 10 years that I had to literally reassess and I became completely irrelevant in the uh, consultancy space that I had dominated for 30 years because yep. I was out of play for two years. And when I came back, all of those clients were, we're glad to see you, but we've got a new mentor. We're glad to see you, but we've got a new provider. And, um, you know, good luck to you. You know, if, when we get something, we'll give you a call. But, you know, right now we're set. And so it was literally the, the thing about being irrelevant that I think is the most tragic and the hardest to overcome is that you lose your momentum. And when you lose momentum, it's like trying to start a fire from a cold start. It's really hard. Yeah. But if you've got some warm coals, you know, and you can get it going pretty quick. But if you don't have anything, even if it's burned down, if you have nothing and it's stone cold. Yeah. And this, like when I, when you mentioned, when you messaged me today and you know, you said you wanted to talk about, you know, becoming irrelevant. The first thing that came to mind for me was really, well, two things, the research needed to find your ideal client and then actually like knowing that idea, knowing who that ideal client is. I was talking with um, actually my one of my trainers. I actually train, I go to the gym and I train with three other trainers and me. So I was chatting with one of those guys and um, he's wanting to launch a new program um, for kind of high-end uh, ex-athletes, a little bit like myself that are getting on in age but want to regain all their kind of sports ability. Um, and wishful fitness. <laughs> no, not at all, Mark. Not at all. Not at all. I thought I'm that would be I'm in better shape now than I think I ever have been, to be honest. I, I agree. Um, just, I just wish is, my body would agree with my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, um, we were talking about how just how important you know client selection is. Like people people quickly, they think about business as money. Whereas if they just thought about business as like onboarding their absolute ideal client at the very beginning, business and money would never be a problem. It's, it's a means to an end. You know, and this is the thing, like when you're irrelevant, you really have to be selective of who you bring on as that first client, that second client. You know, and I say, I tell my clients, those first 10 clients are the absolute key to you, you know, your business being profitable for a long time, for it growing, um, for everything becoming easy. Um, it really is the key thing. And if you're irrelevant in a marketplace, Actually, Mark, can you hear the background noise there? A little bit. Sounds like okay. weed, weed blower. Uh, they're washing down the building. I might yeah. just, I'll hold that thought. I'm going to go and All close right. the door. you ever notice how the timing on that is always perfect when you're trying to record a video or go live or I know. A Zoom call it's it's perfect i know i know but um you know we can get over it because it's the internet and no one's no one's that serious you know it wasn't it wasn't that bad anyway um 
Yeah, it's when you're saying when you're irrelevant and coming back to building your business, when you, there's no momentum, you got, you're collecting wet sticks to try and rub together to start the fire, the kindling, the, you know, the little scraps of paper and stuff. Client selection is at its most important, I believe. And well, if, you can, if you can get one good client, you can start a business. If you, right. if you bring on a shitty client that you're just bringing on for a little bit of money, you're bringing on trouble. You're not starting a business. So I'm glad you used that we use this analogy of starting a fire from nothing mm. because I've been a camper for, since I was <laughs> tiny. So I've, I've made, fun. I've made thousands of campfires and the, the two things that immediately come to my mind when we talk about the relevancy and being relevant to our clients and starting from stone cold. We can't get an ideal client unless we are relevant to that client. And your selection process means that you need to start with really, really tiny little twigs and really fine grass that can take that heat and get an instant result, even though it's small. But then from that, you put a little bit bigger twig on top and a little bit bigger twig on top of that until pretty soon you've got small sticks and then from small sticks to small branches. And that's really building trust and yeah, building yeah. relevance. It's interesting. When I first did Product Launch Manager and I was looking for my first client, um, and really I was, when I, when I went to America and studied, I was irrelevant. No one knew me in the market. No one knew me. Well, that's what 2009 Facebook was very early days in the Australian market. Like I didn't know any marketers. Like it was, you know, I'm, I may as well have been an alien landing on, on earth. And. Oh, you were, you talk funny. When, <laughs> when I came back from um, training, they said to us, okay, just charge 25,000 US dollars, get the payment up front and get a commission on what you make on the back end. Now that made sense. And, you know, I did hold out for that client, but that client actually took a little bit of kindling first. Mm -hmm. exactly. And I remember that my, like my first client, Greg came to me and said, he came across me somehow. I don't even know how, I can't remember how. And he came to me and said, well, actually, I think I reached out to him and I said, mate, if you send me your little um, intro video script there, I'll run a, like I'll do some editing on it. And he was like, what are you going to charge me? And I said, ah, oh, three grand, that'll do. And that started a relationship where a few, couple of months later, like he was blown away with what I wrote. A couple of months later, he, he gave me that $25,000 check and gave me many, many more. He would give me a $25,000 check every, every quarter for approximately five years and a lot of other checks for commissions and stuff. We grew a huge business with him. It was fantastic. But it all started with me <sighs> reaching into his world and becoming relevant to him, looking mm -hmm. at what he did and saying, let me improve that for you. And I was willing to do it for free. And he asked how much. And I was like, ah, well, well, three grand. And he was like, okay. You know, it was a small thing for me, but it started a very long and, you know, it started a bonfire. So just two points. One of the first ones is that that situation is such a common situation when you have something that's brand new. And my response to that is always, I want to be perfectly fair with you. I want to be completely fair with you on this. We don't have a working relationship and I want to prove the value of what I have, I, I'm going to have for you. So I'm willing to do it for $3,000 this one time only. Mm. So you, you anchor that point at that point with the understanding that this is to prove your, your value. The second part of that is, and it's very closely tied to that. And this goes back to like marketing 101 meet your client on their journey where they are. If you're sufficiently advanced to become irrelevant, you have to step back 
to where they are on that path and to meet them there and only reveal to them enough to get them to move to the next step and then and get the result. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened. Like he was, he didn't know about launches. I didn't tell him, tell him anything about launches. I told him, you know, you know, I do a bit of copywriting, that sort of thing. Until I got that first job across the line, he was blown mm -hmm. away and it mm -hmm. produced results. And then he was like, oh, what, could, what else can we do? And I said, oh, by the way, I'm a product launch manager. You should do this, 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 and this. And that just, that just took off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's, and this is the thing, like you, you can't go in all guns blazing. And that's what I see a lot of people doing these days. A lot of people friend me and their banner above their Facebook image is I'm a high ticket closer. And it's Buy like, my stuff. I'm a high ticket closer. And it's like, delete. I don't even friend those people because I know what's coming next. I know there's, okay, there's three or four follow-up messages saying, hi, how are you? What business are you in? You know, it's so obvious and ridiculous that, you know, a potential customer is is scared away or repulsed by what you're doing straight away. Um, and, you know, a lot of people will teach, oh, yeah, you've got to have a big banner with high ticket closer on it to become a high ticket closer and, you know, put forward your big authority move and all this sort of stuff. But you really don't because a lot of people, they don't, they don't even need a high ticket closer. You know, it, most people want a genuine person. Yeah, and I... I'm not a, I've never been a hardcore sales guy like that. That whole philosophy of for me to win, you have to lose. I've, I want what you've got, which is the money in your wallet and, yeah. you know, hope that you don't refund. Um, yeah. I've yeah. never had refunds ever because I've always focused a hundred percent on the client. Yeah. And, and understanding that again, back to our original concept of relevancy, I think when I felt like I was becoming irrelevant or had become irrelevant, it was very challenging to the ego to, to do that. Oh, definitely. And, and, you know, when you, you just realize how fragile your reputation is, if you're not immersed in the game all the time, it, the world moves on so quick because things move so fast. Attention changes quick technologies change all that and if you're not in the game all along you just become roadkill along the way so coming back from that um it is really trying to understand what it is the client what is the pain what is the client really in need what are they missing that will help them and doing that and what i call results in advance i always give the client more results in advance that most people are charging for. And it creates a lot of grief amongst competitors in the marketplace. Like, why are you doing that? Why are you giving it away? You're cheapening the process. I find that really interesting because I'm one of the most expensive, you know, individuals that are in the space. If you look at the raw dollars, but I'm also the most um, highest return ROIs of anybody. I mean, I've, the largest that I've had so far with a $50 million company was a 4,880% ROI. That's a big return. That's huge. That's, That's huge. Big, big return for a $50 million company. Oh my God. It was in the millions. It was in the millions. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. It's yeah. Like most people, I feel if they were irrelevant, they're panicking and they're operating from that panicking space. They're hustling instead of being smart and executing. They're and panicking. this is the they're thing I, I, you know, I kind of say a lot, you know, you shouldn't hustle. You don't need to hustle. That's very different to not doing the right work. Hustling is more of a scattered, no clear approach, panicking operating from scarcity type of approach versus operating smartly and executing on a, on a strategy, you know, with principles behind it versus just 
you know, kind of letting everything out there. It's got to be, it's got to be planned. It's got to be well executed. Um, and it doesn't matter whether that's something big or something small, you still need to have that, you know, proper execution it has to operate, you know, from a principle based approach um, versus just being the next, the next kind of marketer screaming and yelling stuff. Um, there's a lot of, there's too much of that out in the marketplace. Well, there's always been too much of that. And there always will be, because that's an easy way out. And the yeah. hustle and grind is the brute force approach. It's just, it's just throwing yourself and all your weight into the marketplace and hope that there's, you know, you're going to take something out with you. And yeah, that's and that, really a weak, weak, weak way of doing things. Uh, yeah, you see people doing that and there's no thought around um, client selection. It's all no. about money. It's all about harvest for them. What can I take out? And it's, yep. it's a lot, you know, we talk today an awful lot about, you know, climate change and sustainability. Sustainability is a big thing for me in business. And I'm not talking about the ecological aspect because that's what gets most of the attention. But for me, for me, sustainability is, are you sustainable? Are you in this for life? Is your relationship with your client for life. I'm not looking to replace clients, turn and burn and churn, which yeah. is what happens so much with so many of these uh, individuals. They're just like, keep knocking them down. You know, if one, if one doesn't go, there's another one out there. If you, if you screw up and the guy hates what you're doing, and you don't deliver, no problem. There's always another fish. Well, guess what? It's getting fished out. You yeah. know, the world is getting fished out. And that means that we have to take a different view of sustainability if we are going to survive as an economically free uh, ability to, to continue to do business. Otherwise, it's going to get an, taken over and regulated um, by somebody else that we have no input on. And we will have lost this incredible freedom that we have to come up with an idea and take it to market and monetize it. Uh, we won't be able to do that. And there aren't that many places in the world where you can do that. Uh, there's many, many countries where the regulations for starting a business and, you know, being in business for yourself is incredibly regulated mm -hmm. to the point where you always are just a tiny little operation. You can't grow it to any substantial size because then it's a threat to the established institutions. Um, just going back to you know, giving some clear kind of points as to what someone can do if they do become irrelevant. Like, as I said, from my perspective, it's really around, you know, doing that market research again um, right. and finding one clear communication channel to put the message out, you know, to prospective clients and then being super strict on client selection. Like they're probably the top three things that, you know, I, I would look at it's sometimes it feels, as I said, we've all been there where we, you know, you quickly become irrelevant. You find yourself kind of flailing in the water. Um, and it's when you have like the, in those times you have to slow down, you have to execute very like, very smartly and you have to be thinking about what you're doing. You can't be just hustling for the sake of hustling. Um, that hustling, you know, it, it may open a door, but, you know, I always see that as, you know, that could be, that's a, a lot of the time where people who climb, people who climb the wrong ladder start out from hustling. They're hustling, hustling, hustling. They end up halfway up a ladder going, hang on a minute, I don't even want to be up this ladder. So the starting point is key. And, you know, as they say, you've got to have the end in mind. But, you know, when you're just, you know, in those moments where you, you feel irrelevant, you feel lost in the woods, um, you've got to find a clear path out. It can't be a, you can't be crazily, you know, running around trying to run out of every single gap in the trees. So let's step back to our fire example, because mm. this is perfect. So we've got a cold fire 
There's nothing there. And we do have some, we do have some twigs and we do have some grass and we have a few little scraps of paper that are drying up that would start a fire. But somehow we have to get a point of ignition. So is that point of ignition, is it a lighter? Is it a match? Is it flint and steel? Is it two sticks we have to rub together? All of which have different amounts of frustration and focus and attention and energy to get to it, to make that work. Um, some are easy, some are hard. I mean, this is the thing. This is what I'm talking about with the hustle and the right. smart exactly. execution. You know, the hustle is probably rubbing two sticks together. Yeah, exactly. Whereas, whereas execution is having a Zippo lighter, knowing even if it's wet and it's raining, that that Zippo is going to light every time. And even better, even better is if you were smart, you'd take a little bit of that uh, mosquito spray and then put that little mosquito spray on those sticks and then light it and boom, you're off to the races. But here's the point is that even if you light the fire, if you're irrelevant, you have to get to the point of being relevant again. And that's the gap between the spark and actually starting the fire. So how do you get that? And this is where, you know, you talk about hustle. It's exactly the opposite. It's Tai Chi marketing, mm. right? You ever seen them do Tai Chi? It's all yeah. slow, right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about focus. We're talking about attention to detail we're talking about awareness and in that state of focused awareness we're going to find a new opportunity and say oh this is this is an area that needs to be served that's not being served right now yeah and then this is the key this is what bridges the spark to make the fire that makes you begin to develop relevancy it's the one question and that question is why is that important? And if you can answer why that is important, then you follow it with the same question. And why is that important? And now you begin to create the pathway to future relevance and to future development. And in the process, you're seeing, you're witnessing, you're living the steps from where the relevant market is to where the new relevancy is that you're guiding them and leading them to that awareness by answering, why is that important? It's like, I got to hustle. Why do you have to hustle? Cause I need to make money. Why do you make money? I need to pay my bills and I want to buy a Lambo. <laughs> well, why is that important? Because I need ego, you know, and it goes, it, you go down all those roads and you find out that you don't need the money. You, you mentioned it earlier. You don't need the money. You need, fulfillment of purpose in life that's what drives people that really is what drives people and the money is secondary to providing purpose look at all the people that have committed suicide that were wealthy famous individuals but they had no purpose in life and they felt empty and abandoned and lost yeah and so they're done it's funny i find there's there's a couple of different you know just talking on that point of purpose and money um i find the hustlers continue to go in this loop where they they get money then they lose money they get money then they lose money they get money then they lose money because they have no purpose and the ones with purpose continually grow on a nice smooth scale the the hustlers and the grinders are in the I call it basically the economic drug model. They get a, <laughs> they get a fix and they get high and then yep. they come down and then they got to go get a fix and then they get high and they come down and they just go through this cycle over and yep. over yep. again and they get more and more addicted, including uh, alcohol, including substance, including sex, including everything. All the abusive, addictive behaviors follow that same model, pleasure, pain, because it's dopamine driven. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, like taking that back to relevance, if you're just after a cheap thrill, 
it's hard to become irrelevant and stay relevant because you're constantly falling off the off the perch and starting again and people in that situation they burn out you know it's when I, when you say that chasing the chasing the thrill i think of like hang gliders and parachutists and base jumpers and bungee jumpers the, it's um, like they're, what are they they're the guys that fly the fly now the, wing, the wingsuits, wingsuits yeah yeah wingsuit stuff crazy yeah but there, i think there's a lot of people in business that are operating just the same way uh, totally totally yeah. They're a wingsuit. They're chasing the deal. They're chasing the deal. Yeah, they were a wingsuit pilot trying to get closer to the rocks each time. Until you hit them. Then it's no fun. I got to share with you the first time I ever flew a hang glider. I was about maybe 17 years old. Yep. And it was in California and it was on the coastal hills. And in May, which is when I was doing this, um, these thistles, these Russian thistles grow all over the hills. And they're like just covered with spikes. I can see and these purple here. flowers. What? I can see what's going to happen here. <laughs> exactly. And so I took off down the hill and, you know, lifted off, got my feet up off the ground. And, and I was probably only three, four feet off the ground. It was great. The, the feeling was fantastic. And then there was a crosswind that hit me and, blew me directly into the thistles and it was a mess it was a mess and I said you know what the the feel is the same whether you're a foot off the ground or a thousand feet off the ground and you know this was really easy to happen you know when I was three feet off the ground what would happen if I was a thousand feet up and there was a crosswind and in fact I had a friend of mine that was hang gliding and he was about four or five hundred feet up and a military helicopter flew by and he got caught in the in the prop wash and it threw him into the hill. And wow. he was seriously, seriously hurt uh, doing that. And there was nothing that he did. It was nothing that he could do to control it. Completely disrupted the airflow, completely disrupted the lift, game over. Mm -hmm. So if you play that way, if you're playing fast and furious, you're going hot and hard like that, uh, you're going to have a crash. Yeah, you, the rewards are good, but but the downside is equally the risk reward factor is on on the same scale. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it, it's a different kind of irrelevance. Yeah. It's out of the control again. It's like COVID trying to think. Maybe. Well, not, not even like COVID. COVID was COVID. I think more than a probably more than something that knocked people off their perch as far as irrelevant. It was almost like I saw it as an opportunity and I'm sure there's a lot of people that did see it as an opportunity, but there are a lot of people that saw it as, you know, our businesses have been shut down. Now we've become irrelevant. Now we have to start again um, and we've got to work harder than ever. Um, and I think it's a, it's a good reminder or really I guess what we're talking about today is just a, it's a reminder to say, slow down and assess the, assess the situation. Um, like I'm a, I'm a big believer. I'm constantly telling the, my guys, you know, to follow one clear path, remove all the ridiculous. So, mm -hmm. you know, clear the mind, clear the path forward and just follow the path. You know, there's always going to be stuff running across the, the path but you've got to be able to stay on the path and, and just move forward slowly, whether that's slowly or quickly, um, you know, with focus, you'll get to your target. It's, you know, things like COVID, um, they come along and they're out of our control. It's like the helicopter and the prop wash. It's out of your control. Right. But unexpected, unexpected disruption. And you've got to be able to, like know your purpose and know where you're headed right. to be able to stay on the path, to stay relevant, to be able to move forward. If you don't, you have to go back to the drawing board. And this is the thing. This is probably the bigger conversation. It's like, 
if you don't have that bigger purpose, if you don't know where you're going, you have to slow down, even to a crawl. Maybe put the fire out. Maybe you're up the wrong ladder. Maybe put the fire out completely. Mm -hmm. Sit for a minute. Boy. You know, collect some twigs and rebuild it decide, right. Like choose the path that you want to actually chase. It's funny, like I, you know, I've obviously have a lot of businesses come to me. There's um, most of my guys have been with me two or three years now at least. Um, but it's always interesting when new people come on board because a lot of them do come chasing money. And, you know, we all love money. It's great. But at the end of the day, um, my most successful clients are the ones with a bigger purpose in mind. They have a bigger vision for where they're going. They have a bigger, a bigger vision, like a vision past money. Mm -hmm. And that, that will keep you on the, on the path. Whereas just chasing money, um, people are always looking for the next secret. And I tell my guys, there are, there is no secret. There are no secrets to be had. There's work to be done. And there's a process in for that, but there are actually no secrets to that. Well, it's a secret if you don't know it. <laughs> right? Well, I guess it's, so, it's, but it, it, you, it, you know it, what I mean? Like in today's marketing world, everything's a secret and everyone's got a secret about some secret, okay. you know, and it's like that sort of stuff is marketing BS. That's tactics. Those are all t secret tactics. Yeah, the it's tactics all have a very short life. Yeah, fundamental, fundamental strategies and foundational principles don't change. Yeah, and that's right? why I'm, value I, is exchange for <coughs> some form of compensation. That's fundamental. Yeah, and if you stick to that, there'll always be a transaction, you'll always be in a position. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, getting back to this whole concept of, of relevance. Um, and disruption like COVID. I looked at COVID as being a huge opportunity, just like you did. It's an equalizer because essentially what it did is it took the guy that was at the head of the, of the market, the head of the big player, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. And it made him just like a startup because everything that they based their business on was disrupted. The people that were focusing on what they lost are the ones that are still in a struggle and a fit today. The ones that said, okay, there's been a disruption. There's been a disruption. That's all they're saying. The disruption was an event. There's only three things that can happen in any event and two of them are bad. It can get worse, it can stay the same, or it can get better. And for it to get better, we have to be able to define what better is. So this is the point of purpose. If we come back and, and focus on our own purpose for ourselves and for our family, that's, that's meaning, that's purpose. And we can build any kind of business around meaning and purpose. Because every, every situation is going to move us toward our goal or away from it. Yeah. And I think that that business of not reflecting and not slowing down when you're so busy being busy and you're so hustling and grinding, you haven't got the time you don't make the time to consider what's going on you yeah, have to have that meditation you have to have that focus you're not making smart long-term decisions right no, it's all reactive it's yeah. all reactive type work um and in reaction as i said you know you can't choose clients properly you're, you're chasing money it's it just be, you're setting yourself up for failure you know that's that thrill chasing you're gonna you're gonna go back around the circle again <clears throat> at some point in the future. Right. Um, I think we're wrapping up on the hour, um, Mark. So any final words in someone that may have become irrelevant and looking for a way back? Any pointers that they can... Ir irrelevance, being irrelevant is a temporary scenario. It's a temporary situation. If you look at life, we have ups and we have downs. And when you're irrelevant, you're at the bottom of the cycle and all cycles switch. So no matter how 
dark and deep it may seem right now, no matter how irrelevant it seems, no matter how much momentum you've lost, or even how much you've been set back, it's all temporary. And as long as you keep your wits about you, do the Tai Chi <laughs> awareness model, slow down, contemplate, be aware. The biggest thing is to be aware. Take everything in. If you find yourself saying, I know this, you're not in a state of awareness. You've just closed the door to possibilities. And then finally, the third thing is surround yourself with really good mentors that can challenge you with a diversity of thought. Because out of diversity of thought comes collaboration and out of collaboration comes relevance. I, I think I'll leave it there. I don't want to add anything to that. Um, always good to talk, Mark. Um, we will catch you again next week. Um, I hope everyone has a great week. And Go become irrelevant. Oh, relevant, not irrelevant. <laughs> Cheers. Enjoy the week. Cheers, I guys. Will. Thank you.